So today I'm going to talk about uh, theories of the self and there are two general ways to think about uh, the nature of the self. The first is the ego theory, which is the idea that there's a single unitary entity that exists and is the subject of experience and the center of moral responsibility. And the ego theory is the one that's most familiar, I think, and the one that's more intuitive that I was born and it's that same thing that was me that was born that continues throughout my life and is who I am today and will be who I am when I die and is, uh, you know, what is conscious, it is my ego that is conscious, that's myself, and that is what is praised and blamed when I do good and when I do evil. So that's the ego theory, and that's um, one option in terms of thinking about the nature of the self. Alternative, we might, alternatively, we might think of the self as a bundle, which is a set of sensations, thoughts, and memories that bear various relations to one another over time and at a single time. So the bundle theory is the idea that there's not one single thing that lasts throughout your whole life, but that there are sets of things, particularly experiences, perceptions, memories, that you know change over the course of time, but it's that, it's that bundle that continues and constitutes the self. There'll be lots of different kinds of uh, bundle theories that we'll talk about later in the lecture. Um, so be thinking about which theory of the self makes most sense to you? Does it, is it the ego theory or the bundle theory? And as we go through the different puzzle cases, Blackmore considers several different kinds of puzzle cases um, as challenges to our theories of the self. And so as we go through those, think, you know, is it the ego theory that best accommodates my intuitions about this puzzle um, or a bundle theory and, uh, you know, which one works best? We'll start with the real cases and then we'll look at the thought experiments um, in a little bit. So the first of the real cases is dissociative identity disorder. And this is also known as multiple personalities and several cases are described by Blackmore in the, in the book. Um, uh, Ansel Bourne, who turns into Mr. Brown, uh, Christine Beauchamp, The Three Faces of Eve, Sybil, these are the more famous of the dissociative identity disorders. Um, one of the curious things about dissociative identity is that it appeared for the first time in the literature in the late 1800s and then basically disappeared for about a century and then reappeared in the 70s or 80s. Um, there are still cases, but this idea, you know, this sort of epidemic that we had in the 70s and 80s where there were all kinds of dissociative identity cases has pretty much disappeared. You don't hear about these cases anymore in, uh, you know, in the popular literature. Uh, and one of the, the theories about this is that um, it may be the therapist or a culture that's obsessed with uh, dissociative identity that, that encourages and, and, and generates these sorts of cases uh, by looking at particular fugue states of a person and, and forming them, um, oftentimes by naming them, uh, into distinct personalities. Um, and we may be inclined uh, to, to ask whether a self that's generated in this way as, a, as an artifact of, uh, of a, a therapy or of a, a particular cultural context, is that a real self or is it less of a real self? Is there a single ego um, and these other selves are fictional? How, how are we going to think about the nature of the self in these kinds of cases? Uh, certainly with respect to um, Bourne and, and Brown, that wasn't an artifact of therapy because he didn't have therapy. He, you know, this was a fugue state that he underwent and did not go through hypnosis until after he returned as, um, as uh, born. So the other real case that we'll talk about is the case of split brain patients. Uh, and those are patients with uh, severe epilepsy. And what happens in epilepsy is uh, uh, what's known as an electrical storm. You're, Neurons are chemical electrical signals and what happens in epilepsy is that those signals get out of control and they just fire all across the brain and the result is an epileptic fit. So what neurosurgeons did to try to prevent the uh, uh, epilepsy, the, the fit from going from one hemisphere to the next because it would start in one area and then uh, 
go over to the rest of the brain, uh, what uh, neurosurgeons would do would be to cut the cords, the corpus callosum, uh, between the two hemispheres. So in the image, you can see that um, you know on the on the right there, those those cords uh, between the two hemispheres, they just cut them, and so the you know, when the fit would start on one side, uh, it would not transfer to the other hemisphere. Uh, in this study, the person was shown an image where there's, you know, one picture on the right side and one picture on the left side, and um, the left hand points to uh, the picture, the shovel, that corresponds to the image that is processed by the right hemisphere, that is to say the image that's on the left, and uh, the right hand uh, points to the picture uh, that corresponds to the image processed by the left hemisphere, the claw. Since language is processed by the left hemisphere, the patient reports seeing the claw, but not the, sh the snow scene. Uh, and when asked why the right hand points to the picture of a shovel, so the left hand only sees, uh, the, the left hemisphere only sees the um, Claw only sees the picture and sees the claw, um, doesn't see the shovel in the snow scene. So if you ask the person, um, you know, the left hemisphere is the source of language. If you ask the person, well, why did you point to this shovel when you're looking at a chicken? Uh, the person will confabulate a story. They'll, they'll make up something that makes sense of what they're seeing, what they're conscious of, which is, um, the, uh, the snow scene, and they'll say, well, um, you know, I needed that shovel in order to be able to shovel out the chicken coop. So they'll make a use for the shovel, uh, even though it was picked because it corresponds with the snow. They don't see the snow, that is to say, the left hemisphere doesn't see the snow, and so they'll make up a story to make sense of this, um, of this shovel. Um, so you have these two hemispheres responding differently to the, the different stimuli that they're, they're getting, uh, but only the left hemisphere is reporting uh, its experiences. So in these split brain patients, you, what they're getting you, uh, pushing you to think about is, um, you know, whether you think the right hemisphere responses, the fact that uh, there is a stimulus and it generates a response of pointing, does that count as consciousness and does that uh, give you a sense that there is an additional self? So what is the relationship between sensation and consciousness, sensation re response and consciousness? What's the relationship between consciousness and having a self? Um, and so your answer, uh, uh, to this question of are there multiple selves depends on how you resolve these issues, depends on how you think about uh, consciousness and selves and responsiveness and so forth. Um, if you're Sperry, uh, then you think yes, you think that there are two selves, there are multiple selves. Uh, each hemisphere is conscious and capable of independent action, so according to Sperry, each is a separate self. So sleep so patients have two selves and two consciousnesses. Um, but you might say no, that um, uh, both hemispheres continue to be united to a single self. And uh, you might have different reasons for thinking there's a single self. Uh, Gazaniga thinks there's a single self because only the left brain is conscious. That reportability is, for Gazaniga, essential to consciousness, and only the left hemisphere, the interpreter, he calls it, is conscious because only the left hemisphere can say what it's conscious of. So if you think self-awareness and you think reportability is essential to consciousness, then you're going to go with Gazaniga here and say, no, there's just one consciousness and one self. Um, and the right hemisphere is not conscious and not a self. Um, different ways of thinking about the self and consciousness influence how uh, people interpret these results. So we have these split brain patients, we have these dissociative identity disorder situations. Um, you know, what is the interpretation of that? That's what the philosopher needs to do in terms of figuring out what these different cases mean. So be thinking, you know, is there an ego? Is there a bundle? What counts as um, the answer, uh, according to you, for these different kinds of cases?